you hear that? What was that? I don't know. It could be. Could it be? It might be. Maybe. Quite could possibly. It be? Hey, what's the name of this podcast? The Bunny Rabbit's Hole. That's what it is. Ah, yes, and we're back. We yes. are back, America. And back world. Yeah. We're not just Americans. Fuck that. You guys won't let us out of our country, so we want to <laughs> include you into our country, even though you right. won't come here because uh, at the time of this recording, all of our passports are null and void. We're not allowed to leave the U.S. because of the vid. But that's all we're going to talk about current events in this episode because we're going to talk about something completely different. And if you don't know what it is that we do here for the first time that you've joined us, and I know I'm rambling a lot because I've just got a lot of saying. What we do here at the Bunny Rabbit's Holes, we take one centralized theme each and every week. Okay, well, we try to do each and every week, but we do each and every week. And what we do is we talk about that theme until something inspires us to talk about something completely fucking different because that's what we do. We talk about other things and until Craig finally gets bored or says, you know what, God damn it, Jason, shut the fuck up. And tell me to shut the fuck up because we're not talking about what we're supposed to be talking about. And that's what we're going to do right now is go back to the main theme and talk about that now. And as Jason said, we take a centralized theme, and we usually research it for about a week or so, sometimes more, sometimes less. Sometimes we wing it. I'm going to be honest. But we um, research both for and against. We don't just take what fits our narrative and throw it out there. Um, but we uh, this is for entertainment, so we also include our opinion and some bad dad jokes. So if you're easily offended, get the fuck out. And who can be offended by dad jokes? Really? Really, people? Are you that fucking shallow? Are you that low that you don't like a good dad joke? Have you heard my dad's jokes? Oh, man, mine too. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Enough said. So, you know what? What are we going to talk about today, Craig? Today we are going to talk about, I know you said we weren't going to talk about current events, but we kind of are because we're talking about self-awareness. Yes. And there's a couple reasons why we're going to talk about (laughs) self-awareness. Uh, one is we got called out, didn't we? Yes, we did. And we deserved it. And we did deserve it. We did deserve it because you and I are both advocates of being self-aware, calling yourself out on your own bullshit. And, you know, when you get into funks, no, you know, notice it, realize it and do something about it. But you and I, and let's, let's face it, the world at this particular moment in time is in a funk right we are in a funk right and it was reflecting within our shows and i'm gonna let you tell the story on who and how we got called out all right so we did i don't even remember the podcast it was something about positivity yeah and so my son you know my oldest listens to um podcast and he always gets pissed off and we take a while before we throw one out because he likes to listen to it but he said he listened to about 20 minutes of that one and shut it off he was like you're talking about positivity but you guys were just negative and it was just and i had to go back and think about it because i i don't listen to our stuff because i we do it so i don't go back and re-listen to it because i probably should so i could learn from my mistakes but i don't like to hear myself exactly and you know it was nice hearing an outside opinion you know call us out on shit that we're talking about you know and this is this is this is the atmosphere and the environment that we're trying to create here at the bunny rabbit's hole we want to be more of a family right you know and we want to have honest and open dialogue with y'all and If we're calling you out for saying something bad or just, you know, like that, not being the best person you can be, when we're not being the best person we can be, we like you guys to to recognize and tell us. Right. You know, and I mean, along with, okay, we all know 2020 has been the, of our lifetimes, the worst fucking year possible. Right. You know, we back in 2016, we were like, oh my God, this is the year of death because so many famous people and celebrities and rock stars and all this all died that year. Right, yep. but that has nothing on this one. No, I think they 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 were escaping. Yes, the cataclysm. <laughs> I I did hear one one little thing about if, if twenty twenty was a flavor of candy, it'd be toothpaste and orange juice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, ew. 
That's nasty. <laughs> yeah. So I, I just I just I thought that one was that was spot on for what this year right. is playing. Yeah, I mean we've you know, besides, you know, the year of shit that twenty twenty has been, you know, we've slipped into a funk. We had we we suffered a personal loss. Yes, we did. Um and so that I know it's I know it, it affected me great dearly and it I put me into a horrible, horrible depression and I'm still trying to fight my way out of it. Mm-hmm. But I'm aware of it. And like the other day it was I think Saturday, I was sitting there going I was counting on my hands because I'm like, I could not remember the last day I took a shower. <laughs> okay. Now that right there is indicative of what a funk can make you do. Yes. And we're not talking about like the, the parliament funkadelic here. We're not talking about you Bootsy, Bootsy Collins or anything like that. We're talking, that's just a funk. Yeah. No funky cold Medina. Yeah. No. No. So I had, <laughs> I sat there and I'm like going, okay, this is a symptom of depression. Yes. And obviously I know why I'm depressed. Um, but I also know how to get out of depressions. And for one is that for me, what works for me is knowing what caused the depression, mm-hmm. what is the root behind it all. And once I know that I can figure out ways around it, but unfortunately I'm dealing with something that I've only dealt with one other time in my life, but it, which was quite sudden then too. Right. You know, And there's, there's, there's no easy way to deal with it, but it's just plowing through every day. And I found that I found a trick for me today to keep me motivated and um, clean part of my office and then sit down and work. It, it's funny you say that because we were going to record this a couple of days ago and I had to cancel on us recording because I was doing the exact same thing. And I couldn't even sit behind my desk because my desk was in a different spot on the other side of the room with a whole bunch of other shit around it. And I realized, Oh fuck, I'm not going to have this room back together in time. Cause I was doing <laughs> the exact same thing. I re- rearranged my office so that, you know, it's, it's nice to, it's almost, sometimes you need a, a clean slate and you can't just like start a new life, you know, right. but something small as rearranging your room yes. can have a positive effect and force yourself to exercise that too release those endorphins you know that too. don't don't get suckered into clickbait like um like i i got sucked into a 15 minute video that says to change your thought patterns and change the way you think mm. do these five things daily it never told me what the five things were. <laughs> and I love Dr. Joe Despeza, but that pissed me off. <laughs> so I was, right. I was self-aware that that irritated me, and I allowed that to irritate me because that was my choice. Oh. <laughs> Nobody else's. But, you know, those are things that we do. You know, we will find, as human beings, we don't want to be in an uncomfortable situation. Right. We will find in an uncomfortable situation is sitting down to work because nobody wants to work. I mean, we're lazy by nature. Exactly. So it's easy, you know, as this podcast is a bunny rabbit's hole, you get sucked into bunny rabbit's holes and YouTube and stuff like that instead of actually doing the work that you sat down to do. Exactly. Now, there are two laws that people uh, who have who are procrastinators should learn and and emphasize okay the first one is Pareto's law now I'm just going to paraphrase these because I can't get them exact if I'm just going to read them off the screen I'm tired of reading things off the screens on this show so the first one is the size and complexity of a given task will grow to the amount of time it's given to do it meaning if you have three weeks so let's say you're you're back in school Mm -hmm. okay you're you're finishing up your your art degree now if you had three weeks to do a project it's going to take you three weeks to do it okay now if you didn't do anything for the first week and a half 
you've got a week and a half to do that same project. Now let's right. say you, you still procrastinate. Now you've got three days. You went from three weeks to three days. Now you have to still get that same project done. Chances are you're going to knuckle down and you're finally going to do it. Well, if we're talking about me, I have three weeks to do it. It's going to come down to three hours. It, right, right. I was going to get all the way that we, you know, we, we all do we condense it. But the, the point being is you don't have to, you, you're going to get the same amount of, the same quality work done in those three hours as you would if you took the whole three weeks to do it, because you're going to spread a little bit of time here, a little bit of time there, a little bit of time here. Instead, right. you could have crammed those same three hours at the very beginning of the first, the first three weeks. And then you had the rest of the rest of the three weeks off. But we don't operate that way. Right. Well, and here's my problem with spreading it out through the three weeks. If it's a, especially if it's an art project, that gives me three weeks time to overthink it, to screw it up, to overwork it. Right. You know, if I just sit down and have three hours and I'm like, and it's something I know I can get done in three hours, if it's going to, if it, I could, because usually knowing what the task is with art, I can kind of have a time gauge in my head of how long it's going to take yeah and so i'm like if it's something that's like colored pencils and something elaborate like that i know i need at least eight hours to work mm -hmm. it so i will start it like nine or ten hours before it's due you right. know See, if, I start, if i start though if i and i'm sorry I didn't cut you off, but if i start it at the beginning of three weeks it, this is you know for artists it's good because yeah you you draw it out then you set it aside, you come back to it the next day, look at it with a new, fresh new eyes and fresh perspective, you can see your mistakes and fix them. But chances are I'm going to get the same quality of work if I do it in that eight to 10 hour span as if I did in a three week span. And you actually summed it up perfect because you, you said exactly what the law means. You're finding things to fill those three weeks. You said you're going to overthink it. You're going to, the project really only takes, you know, just a few hours. And it was the same with same with most tasks, they don't take the amount of time given to do. You can most of the time you can, you know, squish it and put it into a, into a thing. So you, for procrastinators, if you can justify and realize and force yourself to put those three hours together at the beginning instead of at the end, then generally it works out a little bit better. And that's what's what Proto's law. Now the other one is Parkinson law which everybody knows is the 80-20 rule. Meaning you're going to get 80% of your productivity out of 20% of your time. And this goes to, a, it's an economic principle. It goes to, you know, 80% uh, of the wealth is, is owned by 20% of the population, even though that, that is a lot, a lot bigger. You'd say, but most of the, most of the like sales, it's like you get 80% of your sales from 20% of your, your customers. And this, this rule is a rule of nature it's been it, it's an economic principle but it's it flows throughout everything now if you work both of them together you realize that you're going to get 80 percent of your shit done in 20 percent of the time so if you have eight weeks to you know 10 weeks to do it you know you're going to get the entire project done in two of the weeks instead of the 10 of the weeks you're going to get 80 percent of the shit done in two of the weeks so <clears throat> what i'm saying is you need to be cognizant and real, uh, realize, realize time management when it comes to procrastination, which if you can get those things done, it's small rewards. Small rewards bring happiness and happiness brings you self-aware to how life can be. Now, there was a real, uh, we started on something, but I went on a, another little tangent there. Well, I, you know, go along with that. I had a six page paper that was due in one of my classes and I wrote it in 45 minutes, turned it in as it was last minute because mm -hmm. that's how I work and turned it in, got 85% on it. I missed the 15% because I suck at citing things and we do Chicago style. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah so that's, that's where I failed at was the, the, the uh, sighting. But, you know, it's, but that's just it though. I, I know that I have the capability to get into a flow. And if I can get myself into that flow, I can get it done. Right. And the thing is, 
I see, I don't believe in writer's block. I don't believe in artist block because all it really is is a lack of motivation. Exactly. <clears throat> and I mean, you can find inspiration from anywhere. Mm -hmm. I can sit down with a blank piece of paper. If I'm in the mood to draw, I'm going to find something to draw. If right. I'm not in the mood, I'm going to sit there and stare at it and go, oh, I've got artist block. It's not, I don't have artist block. I'm just not in the mood. Yeah. And to me, like, especially writer's block is, to me, it's a lack of preparation. Because if you're writing, say, say you're writing a story, chances are you kind of know where the story is going to go before you get to the ending. You don't just start and say once upon a time and then go, oh, yeah. You know, most stories have, uh, they're usually three acts. They're usually, you know, there's certain uh, character build up to a certain point, And then that changes the story into this until another point. You know, plot points. There's, there's structure to a story. So anybody, any real writer that says they have writer's block just means that they didn't have their story in mind when they started. Right. Because so take, again, take like somebody like James Patterson, okay? The man writes like 11 novels a year because all he does is he writes the first paragraph and the last paragraph of every one of his chapters and he hires somebody to fill in the blanks. And he makes, hundred, he makes hundreds of millions of dollars a year by writing outlines. You know, I say that disgusts me, but, you know, he found a system that worked for him. Right. And how can I really fault him for it when, I mean, the only way I could fault him for it is if the people that, the ghostwriters that he wrote, if he paid them shit wages. That, exactly. Um, like he went to I Fiverr and found some, found some people to fill in the blanks for him, paid him five bucks a chapter. Or Upworks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, you know, this, this whole year, I've been trying my best and I'm like, cause I mean, I, I know this, the stages of grief. I mean, we've all heard them, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And I know, and it's like, I've realized over the last couple of weeks that I have survivor's guilt, mm. you know? So, but it was something that I, because I was sitting there and I kept blaming myself for everything that went on everywhere. And, you know, that's part of survivor's guilt. Right. And, you know, also you start doing things like you get, when you get into a funk, you're depressed. <laughs> there are side effects or symptoms of depression that you don't realize it's your depression that's making mm -hmm. you think this way. Paranoia being one of them. Yeah. You know, when you're depressed, it's easy because you're looking for a target because you're depressed, you're sad, you feel like you have no energy, but you're quick to anger short views definitely and all of a sudden that no energy to brrr, attack mode you know <laughs> right. so it's not that you don't have any energy it's just your mind is just stifling it down it, exactly and now i do want to um i do want to uh, make the uh, the distinction of now, being depressed and clinical depression. Okay. Now, I take I take it's shit for anxieties. You know, yep. so it's you know it it's a real. There are some clinical depressions that you can't just will away. It's a it's a chemical imbalance and it's a serious fucking issue. And if you have it, please seek help. Now, what we're we're talking about some, something that's catastrophic events paced on top of on top of uh beat downs from the year you know 2020 you know we're not talking about the chemical imbalance here we're talking about just being right. in a goddamn funk because shit sucks right okay now so because i don't want anybody to go off on this whole thing it's like well you don't understand depression i'm I, you know I, I take all these pills for this we 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 understand that part and yes it's like i take shit for anxieties you know, yep. I get it. Yeah, and I'm not saying that, you know, this is, this depression is just a depression. It's not, you know, like a clinical disorder or anything like that. Yeah. It's just, 
you know, like you said, it's just shit piled on top of shit. Yes. You know, and but which I will get through and I will overcome it and I will, you know, be hopefully better down the road for it. <laughs> exactly. There's so we've we've talked about um we we've talked about the a couple of great a great self help books. I wouldn't even call them self help books, but there's there's the subtle art of not giving a fuck. Unfuck yourself. Um, what's that one by uh, that uh, Jen girl? Um, oh, uh, something about being a badass. You're a badass. Yeah, you're a badass. Yep. Yeah. So that's a good one too. But yep. there's a there's a a part in the in the book, the subtle art of not giving a fuck, that I like because, I mean, I liked all three books, but this one he he has a thing. Just because what happened to you is not your fault, it is still your responsibility on how you react to it. Right. And how you address it. So right. now, okay, let, let's say it's something is not, I won't say mundane. It's, it's still, it's, it's, it's traumatic as say losing your job. Okay. You lose your job. What are you going to do? Okay, so now you're gonna go on a three day bender and now you don't have the, you waste all your money at the bar, now you don't have money for rent. You know, there's, right. or you could grab yourself by the bootstraps, put your resume together and just go get a better job. Right. You know, there's, I mean, those are, it's, that's a very vague and very generalized thing, but the, the, the point is, how you react to shit is is up to you. Like we always talk about it here, being offended is a choice. Right. And how you overreact or underreact to certain you know situations in your life is on you. Right. Now, I will throw the caveat out there that with you know 22 million people facing eviction without a possibility of getting a job in the future and the and you know unemployment benefits are running out and the the government took a three-day weekend i know we're not talking about current events but just talking about 2020 in general just being fucked as fucked can be for so many people it is we're all as as a society in this situation at some point in time even if it's not directly affecting us it's affecting people we know. Right. We're seeing this, you know, ever there's, I don't think there's a single person in our country that doesn't know somebody that's se severely affected by the situation that's going on in 2020 is a motherfucker. We've already talked about that. So how you react going through all this stuff is it, it's, it's going to be a mindset. It's going to be a journey. It's going to be uh, it's going to be climbing Mount Everest of getting out of depression for this, this fucking year. Right. Well, and like, but there's, when it comes down to, I want to get back to the self-awareness and I'm, and the best way for me to do it is by using examples. Mm -hmm. So, um, being, when you get depressed, you had, you're, you're letting the negative energy in. Yes. And you're putting negative energy out. Mm -hmm. So therefore mm -hmm. you're attracting more negative energy. And now what? an example of this is the day that I had to go to, let's just call it the uh, funeral. Okay. Um, my ex-wife knows what I'm doing that day and is texting me trying to pick a fight. Now I look at that and I'm like, okay, I'm not dealing with this today. I just respond, okay, and turn my phone off right and because it's not worth it but you know i looked at that and i looked back i'm like oh well i manifested that with the negative energy i was putting out i brought negative energy back towards me true and and, and i like to give people the re i don't like to give people the reaction they expect i hmm. like to give them the reaction they do not expect or the reaction they deserve right well, if somebody wants to pick a fight with me, I'm not going to let them because I got more to do. But, you know, I, all that, I realized all that. So I started, you know, okay, I got to change my patterns, got to switch stuff up. 
and now I'm climbing out of the funk, but I'm not quite there yet. <laughs> yeah. But you know, in that case, somebody that's somebody that's picking a fight, they don't deserve the fight. They deserve right. to be fucked with. Right. So giving them a thumbs up emoji would have been <laughs> right. Would have been more of an appropriate, you know, uh, to me that would be more of a re- appropriate response than you know even going down that path that she wanted. Right. You know, because that's what she wanted. That's not what she deserved. Right. But and we talk a lot about uh, a- attraction, and mm-hmm. so. And you kind of you kind of brought it up there with manifesting and you know bringing the you know you're putting out negative energy and so negative energy is coming back. Now I want to throw this out here. Uh, I just recently started watching some master class uh, videos. You know, if you don't know that what master class is, it's a it's a website that's got a whole bunch of different uh, tutorials taught by experts like. Samuel L. Jackson teaches acting and, and shit like that. But doesn't uh, Steve Martin teach one too? Yeah, Steve Martin and Jed Apatow both teach a different ones on comedy, mm. and it's 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 pretty cool. Like Tony Hawk teaches skateboarding and shit like that. Okay, but Sarah Blakely from the company Spanx, she started this company by herself, and I watched hers, and it's actually really cool because a lot of the manifestation and the power of positive thought and um, the law of attraction stuff that we talk about on the show, she used as business principles to start her company. Mm. So it's like this, this woman is a self-made billionaire that made this company manifested this company for herself with through determination and work. And what, you know, it's interesting to see, to hear somebody, that's you know worth a billion dollars talk about a lot of the same you know a lot of the same shit that we talk about here just to make our lives better right you know what if you're really feeling down go on youtube and listen to just about any video of wayne dyer's yeah she actually talks about wayne dyer i believe it (laughs) he's inspired thousands if not millions of people and he just his voice picks you up. Yeah. He's like Bob Ross on steroids. <laughs> okay, yeah, I can see that. <laughs> He's I've calming, listened. but he inspires you. You you turned me on to his stuff, and I've listened to I I've listened to a bunch of YouTube videos by him. His books are great too. I recommend reading them. See, we recommend reading. Reading's not a, it's not a lost art. No. You should read because that's how you expand your brain. That's how you get ideas. Because there are no original ideas. Your ideas, what you think is original, has already been done. It's just you got a different twist on it. Exactly. And one and of the okay. things. <laughs> so one of the things that I like what she says in this in this video though is, she says every single one of you has had a million dollar idea. Oh, I believe it. But it's like, she's like, but a lot of you have forgotten what it was. <laughs> yep. Because you don't carry around one of these. Just a right. little pad. When something hits you, you write it down. You wake up in the middle of the night, you write it down. Just- I don't leave the house without this pack that's full of art pads and notebooks and shit like that. Nice. And laptop, usually. So... Uh, up here on this, I have this bulletin board back here. You can see the long brown pieces of paper. Those are actually paper towels. Yeah. I've actually pulled paper towels out of a out okay. of a paper towel ma- machine and wrote notes on them, and they're still on this board there because those notes were that important to me at the time. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. So it was the only thing that I had uh, available to me at the time. I'm like, you know, I need something to write with. Right. So right on. So. Right. One of them was from a restaurant. Oh, nice. <laughs> I got it out of the bathroom at a restaurant, and the waitress gave me a pen, and I started jotting down my ideas for a website. And I so, started hand-drawing out the website on the paper. I'm going to spin this into self-awareness. Okay. It's going to be 
this is going to be interesting. All right. So I'm going to jump back to our ghost, you know, ghost explorers episodes where we talk about people doing, you know, the paranormal uh -huh. stuff where they're doing the ghost hunting stuff. Yeah. And we always complain because they tell us what they say, the EVPs say, they have music playing. So, you know, throughout the investigations and stuff. So what made all these things popular was to show ghost hunters with, you know, Jason Hughes and Grant. I can't remember his last name. Right. I can't. But, either. but so, but then Grant had kids and he wanted to be there for his kids. So he backed out and ghost hunters continued without him until the show ended. Uh huh. Well, then last year, Grant decided my kids are now grown. I'm going to put a new team together and start this back up. I'm sure A&E went to him and said, hey, you know. I'll right. Start up and your kids are older. Why don't you get your, back, get your ass back out there and hunt some shit? Right. Um, but he does it because it's his way of helping people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's like, he was self-aware enough to know that he needed to take a break from it to spend time with his children and watch them grow and not miss those formative years. But now right. that they're grown, he can go back into helping people. Uh -huh. So he was self-aware enough to know where he was at in his life, what he needed to do, take a step back from doing what he loved doing, knowing that he could come back to what he loved doing once his kids had grown. Right. You know, but in, if you haven't watched it yet, it's on Hulu, the first season. There's only one season right now. It's 12 episodes. What's, he doesn't tell. what's the exact title of it? Is it Ghost Hunters? It's just Ghost Hunters. Okay. Um, he does. They don't tell people what what the voice says. There's no music playing during the, the investigation parts. I mean, the, like when they're talking to the camera, there might be some music playing in the background. But when they're actually like doing the investigation, no music playing. Oh wow! They, no. It's like they listened to our podcast and took our advice. We manifested this shit, man. Right. <laughs> See? It does work, people. Mm -hmm. Proofs of the pudding. The yeah, and I always like that. I mean, I like Jason too, but I always like Grant too. And yeah, I was bummed with that. No, I'm actually I'm I'm gonna check that out here when probably when we're done. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I I've, I've been watching it for the last couple of days, so nice. Because I haven't quite got the energy to watch Umbrella Academy yet. <laughs> uh, my wife powered through that in like about eleven hours. I believe it. The new Umbrella Academy. Yep. Yeah, I've heard everybody's told me that was great, but it it just sparked memories for me, and I can't deal with right now. And so. so I walked in at the very end of the last episode, and I saw the twist for season three. Oh. I saw the cliffhanger, so I'm like, oh, I guess exactly. I don't need to fill in the blanks, do I? Right. It, and yeah. it, I I could still watch the show and not be disappointed but right but well, it was kind of a bummer that I, I just happened to come downstairs when that that part was finishing I'm like oh <laughs> okay <laughs> well and you know going on this whole manifesting thing and stuff like that so as you all know and as you know I played Dungeons and Dragons you know and we D -D. no longer yeah D -D. <laughs> and we no longer have a DM, so I was going to have my friend take over DMing. And then I start seeing things, and I, I logged into my school's LMS, and there's an announcement in one uh -huh. of my classes. So I <clears throat> clicked on, read the announcement, and the announcement was searching for DMs for our online Dungeons and Dragons groups. No shit. Yep. That so is like, awesome. I'm like, well, I guess that's that's my signal from the universe that I need to take over as DM for our group and let the other guy play because that he already DMs another group. So I'm like, I'll just DM and you can play. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, but I'm like, I'm gonna need some help because I've only done this a, like a couple times. <laughs> <laughs> nice. No, that's uh, that's actually pretty cool that uh, that would happen like that. Mm-hmm. So, okay. 
that shit happens to people more than what they they understand and they realize. And the part of that was you. I think it's a perfect example of self awareness. Mm -hmm. That, and it's also part of a manifestation and the law of attraction. What we talk about a lot in here is being self aware to understand clues when they hit you, because. Right. You could have just read that as a, a strange coincidence. That, oh man, they're looking for one too. Maybe Dave wants to do it. Right. They, no, you <laughs> you read the clue as in no. Dave was probably trying to tell you subtly that, dude, I can't do it. But he didn't want right. to hurt your feelings. So this right. is the universe coming out and saying, Craig, hello, they fly. Right. It's your turn. Right. You need to do this shit. <laughs> It's yep. got, it's got dungeon master and online in the goddamn thing. And you happen to read that, that page that day. And he went, Oh shit. <laughs> it's yep. like a fucking wet towel to the face of reality. And, and that the, the universe gives you these clues all the goddamn time or God or Yahweh or whoever you, you think gives you the clues right out there. The answers come to you. You just have to, be receptive yes not just receptive yeah i mean yeah you have to be receptive but i mean you can sit there and go i'm receptive but be closed off the entire time because you're not you're just it, going it, you're looking at everything with like closed eyes or you're interpreting the wrong clues right right it and it there's a so when i was when i was a kid we went to you know I was an altar boy. We were Catholic. We went to church and our priest told us this joke when we were, I remember this was, we were young. He tells us this joke and it was, he was, he had a message behind it, but he wanted to tell us this joke. He said, okay, so this blind lady walks into, walks into a church, says, God, I really need to win the lottery. It would really change my life and change my life for my family. And, and, you know, so you know, she prays and that, that week she comes back and she doesn't win. She comes back and said, God, I really, really need to win this lottery. Can you please, please help me? Well, she leaves and that week she doesn't win again. So finally, she comes back to church the third week in a row. Say, God, I need to win the lottery. And finally, God speaks to her and says, Hey, you have to buy a ticket. Right. <laughs> so and that's that's it. And I, I remember this because he was saying it's like, yes, it's like you can ask God or ask the universe or manifest whatever you want, but there's still things you have to do to make it happen. If you gotta it's put not it in the upon a star here, it's right. And, so it's kind of like, so we, we talk about chaos magic and doing sigil magic, which, you know, if you want, I'm not going to go into what sigil magic is. There's YouTube videos on it. We've done an episode on it. You can go and you can go and listen to that. But part and parcel of what you do is you do basically a spell and your, um, it's for your will to bring you something. Okay. Now, you're supposed to forget about it, but then still do things that are heading you towards that direction. Now, one of the reasons I really think chaos magic can work or manifesting can work is because you can train your subliminal to do little things each and every day to obtain that goal. Right. And, and that's it. Even if you have to do something, you know, even if chaos magic is tricking you or making a vision board is tricking your subconscious into doing things that would lead you to the path of getting whatever that wish or the goal was. It, it, it's kind of like the ticket thing. It's like you still have to do little things to make it work. Sorry, I was, I was killing a bug. <laughs> my wife was like, like, what, what, what's, what's he doing there? <laughs> she came in to see what the hell I was pounding on and why. So I was showing her. I'm like, 
a bug flew in my notebook, so I slammed slam my notebook down and started pounding on it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, I'm trying to make a point. He's pounding on the desk like, <laughs> sorry, like man. he's a southern lawyer. <laughs> but no, you're right. I mean, if you want something, regardless of how you get it, you still have to put in the work. You still have if to you want, it. If you want to walk a thousand miles, you got to put in the steps to get there. Exactly. The journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. Right. You know, and so if you want, if you to, want to lose the, weight by walking the treadmill, you have to take the clothes off the machine first. But I don't know. That makes it a little bit... Ed builds up dexterity by dodging it as they fall on there. <laughs> right, it gets tangled up around your feet. And... Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you can't learn how to swim without getting in the water. Right. You know, see, there's, there's a lot of other fucking cliches. You, can, you, know, you can't catch fish <laughs> without a put, put your line in the water, you know. Right. Well, no, because some guys catch fish barehanded. Or spears. Yeah, or spears. So it's not always dynamite. Lying. Yep. <laughs> that would be fun. Oh, that would be fun. Yeah, but I mean, but really, when it comes down to it, if you're upset, it, like, see, like somebody is talking to you and they say something that upsets you, instead of getting mad at that person and just reacting, stop. Pull yourself out of the situation for a minute. Even if you have to excuse yourself from that person for a minute, say, look, hey, I got to go to the bathroom or something. I'll be right back. Mm -hmm. Then stop yourself. Go into a little area where you're by yourself and just start thinking. Is what that person did that made me mad, was that a reflection of something about myself that I don't like? Because 80% of the time it's going to be. Good, good point. Good point. You know, and, and if that's the case, you recognize that and realize you're not mad at that person. You're mad at yourself because you don't like yeah. that part of yourself. And if you don't like that part of yourself, you fucking change it. Exactly. You know, and that's a lot of what jealousy is too. It's not, you're not mad at the other person or you don't want to be the other person. It's actually a negative look, viewpoint of yourself in your situation in comparison to right it's like when like say you work like 60 hours a week and your off time you either sleep or spend with your family so you have no time for anything else but all of a sudden you're getting accused of cheating by somebody right chances are if they're accusing you of something it's because it's what they're actually doing you know, our government does that. Everybody's doing it. You just have to be aware of these things. It, right. So, you know, if like in like when you're down and depressed and stuff like that, if you're getting paranoid about your partner might be talking to somebody else or something like that, look at what you're doing. Is something that you're doing you maybe feel guilty about, so therefore you're projecting that onto that other person. You have your you have a lot of your own insecurities. Yes. And so it's those insecurities of yourself that is making you paranoid about this other person. So therefore you're projecting it onto them there. So you think that they're doing that and you don't feel justified until you prove that they're doing that and you wreck a good relationship in the process. It, right. No, uh, trust me, I've been through relationships that probably could have been salvaged had we just talked. Right. But. I don't know. I I attract a certain uh, type of stubborn <laughs> woman <laughs> that is very much like myself, who is right. very stubborn, right. and I'm a know-it-all, and I hate to be wrong at anything, even when I have no idea what I'm talking about. I hate to be wrong. It's a character right. flaw. I know this, and I I make fun of myself. I do a lot of self-deprecating humor about myself because of this and that's how i'm self-aware right that's how i keep myself in check a lot of times but there's a, there's only so much you can joke about not being wrong to somebody who doesn't want to be wrong either right so 
it there's a lot of uh you know communication that has to go on in, in a lot of those situations to make things work but going back to your point about somebody says something that makes you mad right. now before you excuse yourself and before right after they say what they say you know and i know it's nine times out of ten you walk away from that situation and there was that one thing you could have said that could have diffused the entire situation right now i want to challenge everybody listening to this the next time you are in one of those situations find go to the humor find the humor first because if you could find something funny even if you don't even say it out loud you say it to yourself mm -hmm. then chances are you're gonna it's gonna be so much better on your constitution right and trust me i am a ball of anxious energy and if I didn't have my humor, I probably would have died of a stroke at 22. Oh, yeah. Same here. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it, it's, it's true. I mean, as much as I talk about I don't give a shit what people think, that's wrong. You know, right. I've always – I have never I, – I portray that, but I don't really live it, okay? Inside here, it's not the same. I always have given a shit about what – if we didn't care about what people thought, we wouldn't even record this. It, exactly. <laughs> Let's be exactly. Real. <laughs> we wouldn't try to get people to listen to this if we didn't give a fuck. Right. So, so um, going back to the whole self-awareness thing, one thing in order to, we all know that in order to be successful in anything and deal with anything, you have to put yourself in a position where you're uncomfortable. Yes. So, because we don't like to be uncomfortable. As human beings, we do not like being uncomfortable mm -hmm. at all. So, I was in my counseling session last Friday, and my counselor was like, so, you want to schedule more meetings? I said, well, the first thing that popped into my head made me uncomfortable, so I'm going to go with that. And she was oh, like, okay. Awesome. I said, let's do a month. You know? And she's like, okay <laughs> she's like you know if you can't make it i understand and but if it happens a lot then i'll have to give your spot to somebody else i'm like i know you have a job to do you know i get yeah. it <laughs> no that's that's awesome see yeah i've been honestly toying with with doing the same yeah and it's before this is even before coming into into 2020 you know it's like i've been i've been toying with because there's only so much so much you can talk to like your spouse about mm -hmm. without them going, yeah, I got problems too. Right. You know, sometimes right. you need an outside voice to be the one. I mean, even if you, I mean, I mean, yeah, you're just paying this person to listen to you, but you know, still, you know, but it's, it's those, it's those instances where that can create real growth in yourself. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I know I will come out of this with better tools to cope with stuff. And I will come out of this a stronger, better person. There you go. Well, and that, that's what I look for. I always look to better myself. And you can't better yourself if you're not self-aware. I was talking with a lady I work with today, as a matter of fact. And she was saying that uh, she has a weird relationship with some of the other people that work there. Okay. Uh, she's their supervisor, but they don't respect her. Mm. And she feels like she just has to, to babysit and she doesn't feel like she should be babysitting adults. Right. So she said, so I started, I started going to a counselor and I started talking to him and uh, gave me one suggestion. It's like the line of sight. It's like, can you see these other people throughout the course of your day? And she says, uh, yeah. So is there any way you could turn your desk? And she's like, well, I can't really do that. Is there any way you can reposition your monitor so that you can't really see them all day long? Yeah. And then she did that. And she said, and I've never heard this woman, you know, swear, but she said, God damn it. It worked. I'm not <laughs> staring at them and being pissed off at every little thing they do. I can right. do my job 
and I'm not feeling like I'm sitting. It's just, I was wasting most of my day going, why isn't she at her desk? Why isn't she at her desk? Why isn't she at her desk? When, you know, if she's not getting her work done, then, and the other person not getting their work done, then it reflects that, that bad on the entire office. Right. You know, but so, if you're worrying about them getting their work done, you're not getting your work done. Exactly. So she said just some, <laughs> some little, little uh, change in her work environment has actually made her happy. Yep. And yeah, see, my, my counselor's biggest thing for me is to set boundaries. Mm. I'm not good at that. I'm not good at setting boundaries. I'm not good at saying no to people. I'm, but I'm working on it. <laughs> I'm I'm getting better at telling people no. Um, especially so, so if you know, I've talked about this before. I work in a school district, and since the whole COVID thing has started, is really when I've been able to learn to say no. Because now we're dealing with people's safety. Right. And we had people trying to come in into the buildings when they're not supposed to be. And they're like, I just need to get something real quick. It's like, I can go get it for you, but you're not coming in the building. Right. And then it that's how it started. But then it's like, I'm sorry, you can't come in. I'm not going to go get it because then I have to bring it down to you. And you don't know if I'm infected. I'm handing it to you and you're taking this home. Right. So no, this just can't happen until you're allowed back in the building. But but right. <laughs> so it having is sometimes it really it you have to the ability to to say no has to come with something concrete. You know, right. it's like if I tell them no, then they're just gonna be unhappy with me. Well, to me that was never really a good enough motivation to say no. Right. Like, I can just make them happy real quick and just do it. I was like, no. Right. But it's making me unhappy by doing shit that I'm not supposed to be doing. Right. Right. Yeah. And like, it was so, well, I mean, I kind of expect, expect it, but it, like, big weight off my shoulders, but more weight put on my shoulders when I quit my job. Oh, yeah. You know, now I do not have to deal with all that bullshit. But now I've got the, uh, I was used to a lifestyle. Now I have to adjust. <laughs> right. Know? So, yeah. So I'm, uh, I'm going through that stage and I'm just like, which again, on top of everything else, more depression and stuff like that. But it's, it's deal, it's manageable. Right. You know, you know, it's not life threatening or anything like that. It's stuff I can handle. So let me ask you this. Have you set any like short term personal goal growth goals? I know like uh, you're already you're going to school and graduating is a huge priority and all that, but beyond that, have you set any as like as soon as vid's done, this is what I'm I'm going to accomplish this before vid gets over with or anything like that. Have you have you set any of those type of goals? My goals that I've set aren't necessarily like career type goals, but there are goals like, um, like to not lecture my children to not, okay. You know, small self improvement um, like goals, self improvement goals. Yes. Okay. I need, I need to, I need to focus on career goals. I know I need to do this, mm -hmm. but I keep falling. I, and this is me being self-aware. I keep falling back on the fact that, oh, I'm going to school. I don't have time to focus on career goals. I got to focus on school. Right. But I know that's just a cop out because now that I'm not working, I have time to focus. Exactly. And that goes back I to uh, uh, Pareto's law and Parkinson's law. You know, it's like, it's how you manage your time. I got right. this book here. My wife got it to me, gave it to me a couple years ago. <laughs> and all it is for those who who don't see the video the title of that is what this is this my is a, my goals journal there you go yeah. <laughs> and uh it's just each one is just a daily page it's just goals pages and that's what the whole book is it's just but uh 
it's it's good to write. We're gonna. I want to talk about goals for a little bit. It's good to write goals down, mm-hmm. and it's good to write your goals down and put them in a place where you read them each and every day. Otherwise, right. you're gonna forget about them. Right. And so, I do have a goal, a career goal, and my career goal is to quit my job at Christmas. That is, that's my career goal. I no longer want to trade my time for money to somebody else. Right. I want to be right. self-employed by the end of the year. That's manageable. Yeah, it definitely manageable. And yep. so what, so I have this, I have this, this longer, you know, it's not really a long-term goal. Some people call long-term goal five years, but it's five months. Right. I've well, broke that. Go ahead. I have an idea. I have an idea how to get there. Let's do this and go. I am manifesting a sponsorship from Monster Hydro. <laughs> for our I like that. <laughs> but so uh, there's there's so I have a side business and I'm trying to I'm not trying I'm gonna make that my full-time business, my full-time job by the end of the year. Right. But, uh, one of the things that if you're, if you're doing a goal like this and you say, okay, my goal is to be financially independent. Now, what you need to do is take, you know, just an index card, a piece of paper and write down what your, your total bills are to live exactly at the rate that you're living right now. So you write down your mortgage or your rent, your gas, your phone, your utility, all your utilities, even your your Netflix, Hulu, Disney Plus, all your streaming services, write down exactly what it is that you put out every month. But you got to do everything, your food, your entertainment, put it all down there. Now, you times that by 12 because you have 12 months out of the year. Then you divide that by 365. Now, why you do that is because you're taking, if because when you divide, when you times that by twelve, you realize how much fucking money you're spending on just living, just living right. every year. But if you can break it down into, and now I'm getting a lot of this from, uh, I need to give Tim Ferriss from uh, the the four hour work week some some uh, some props here because I got got this idea from him. Now his is a you break it down by 365 because then that gives you your daily total. Now right. you have to figure out what can you do to make, say, say your daily total is a hundred bucks. What do you have to do to make a hundred dollars a day? Mm-hmm. Now, can you, you leave for prostitution? Right. I mean, sell oranges <laughs> and tur- turquoise jewelry under an overpass. Absolutely. Sign me up. So, it's like what you can do to make a hundred dollars a day as opposed to what you're doing now. Mm-hmm. And then when you set this goal up, think about how hard it would be to get back to where you're at right now. Okay. So if you could find another job that paid the exact same in say a year after you did, you tried this, this, um, this trial by fire, trying to live financially free. How hard it would it be to find another job the exact same price, say, with, with a year a year from now? And then if it's not that hard, then it's worth worth going for. Now let's say right. you're you're the CEO of of well, actually that's not even a good thing because most CEOs can jump from company to company. Right. If you know, let's say you. Uh, you have a job as a cocaine, you know, sniffer, you know, tester, and you just love cocaine and you're never, you're not going to find this with another Mexican or with another cartel anywhere else in the world. Then at that point, I would say, just keep your job. Cause right. you have to get paid that to do it. But, you know, realistically, if you're, if you're, let's say you're a plumber and you're, you're, you're a good plumber, you know what you're talking about, but you figure out that you could live on a hundred dollars a day at the same have the exact same thing, but now your time is free. 
your time is freed up to do whatever you want after you make the hundred bucks a day. And if say you can't and you have to go back to being a plumber, how hard would it be to get a plumber job? Right. Probably not that hard. Not especially based off your experience and stuff like that. You it, might go it, in at exactly. a little bit lower pay, but now now going back to being the self-aware part, the reason where I'm going with all this is let's say you didn't try to to live off the hundred bucks a day. Now you're a plumber for another 20 years. Now you're looking back at 15 years ago because you've got five years experience. So 15 years from when you thought about trying it and you didn't do it, you worked another, you worked another 15 years. What are you going to think about it if you didn't try? Right. And now, now it's, you might say it's too late to even try, even though technically it probably wouldn't be, but the where, what that all is, is comfort. Mm -hmm. And he uses the, Tim Ferriss uses the thing and say, you know, the things that change the, the amount of wealth that you have is time and location. Now, I live in an area right now where the price of housing and rent is fucking stupid. Okay, now, it used to be a rule of thumb that if you, you should have one, you shouldn't pay more than one third of your wages towards your housing. But now it's we're in a we're I live in an area where most people are paying two thirds, right? Two thirds of one income are going to just just housing, while the other income is paying the rest of the bills, right? You know, so it's it's hard to get ahead in in a place like this. But if I was to move to say middle of Iowa, where you can buy a home for you know forty five fifty thousand dollars. As opposed right. to that same home here in where I live is three hundred and fifty to four hundred thousand dollars. You know, time and location dictate a lot of what how you know money's valued. Right. Yeah. And, you know, it's just things to think about when you're when you're when you're looking at your self, your situation and a lot it's like a lot of times when people are unhappy. It's because one, they never took the they never took the chance, right? And two, they just settled, right? And you know, so what I'm saying is, it's not too late. And I, I'm not saying it's like you know sp sprinkle some fairy dust on you and you'll just just think, dream big, baby, and you can make it. You can be a star. I'm not talking <laughs> about that type of shit. You know, right. it. It's just as hard to make, you know, $25,000 a year as it is to make $60,000 a year. You're, you're going to work the same amount. Right. It's just the amount of time you're willing, the amount of money you're willing to trade for your time really is the only difference there. Now, right. if you could free up that time and do something you love. Well, let's go back to, you know, talking, you were talking about you know, if I did it when I was younger, then wait, you know, instead of waiting 15 years, let's mm -hmm. look at the cost of those, that 15 year wait. And I'm not talking right. about the right. financial cost. I'm talking right. about the mental, physical, and emotional and spiritual oh. cost. And if we're still talking plumbers, we're talking major physical damage. Right. Being, being a plumber is a very, I mean, you're playing with pipes. Well, most of the time, if you're a residential plumber, you have to crawl under homes. If you're a commercial yep. plumber, you're carrying huge pipe. Yep. And you're doing a lot of work either over your head or bent yep. over yep. or on it, your knees. Exactly. Or you're, you're dealing with cutting oils, which are, you know, can be caustic. You're the you're smelling the glues from putting, you know, it's it's not a safe. Yep. And there's so pipe many butter. Those trade jobs and and stuff like that are physically demanding that can break you down over time. Right. Let's see. I don't know if you, let me see. I don't know if you guys can see that scar right there. Can you see uh, it? Yeah. On your knuckle there? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it goes actually right here. It's a curve. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was from cutting the PVC pipe with a pipe cutter. 
Oh. And it slipped and went. Whoosh. It was six stitches. Oh, nice. Yep. And I was just going to, it was on Easter, and I was just going to sit there and hold it, you know, just holding like paper towel shit around it and just squeezing it just to get stuff. And after like 45 minutes, my wife made me go to the hospital. <laughs> Yeah, I mine's pretty. It's pretty faint now, so I'm not gonna show. It, but I've got one on my thumb that goes down here that I uh, I was cleaning my meat slicer, <laughs> and it flayed from from the from the nail down. And now my like it would be like the uh, the wrinkles that are in the top of your knuckle. It, yeah, mine don't line up anymore. Oh, yep, you sliced your meat, all right. Yeah. Exactly. So, I, but but what are you talking about? The the cost of those fifteen years by not trying, right? Well, and the, the, let's talk about the the. Um, I mean, emotionally, it's depressing. Mentally, it's depressing. It's taxing on your spirit and everything because of the fact that you're doing something you do not want to do, but you have to do in order right. to survive. Yes. And the cost of that. I mean, it comes down to, you know, it's like voting, you know, at what price your soul. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, and, but anymore, we're to a point where it's like, I don't know who's the lesser evil because they're both really fucking evil. Right. It's, do you vote for the it's, evil of the two lessers? Yeah. And so, but I mean, so, but life is like that as well. It's like, I could do this grueling job that's going to tear me apart physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually because it's comfortable. Yes. The, the living is comfortable. Or I could, as you know, Wayne Dyer says, my favorite quote from him is, get comfortable being uncomfortable. Yeah, I, I love that. Yep, and then put myself in that situation and either succeed or don't within a year, I can still go back to that first job that I had because I still have those skills. It, exactly. You could work for – and what you can also do is you'll be revitalized, re-energized, and motivated to probably try to get a better job with a better company. Right. Because there's probably a reason why you didn't want to do what you're doing before with the company that you're in. Right. You know, and you don't have to go full on independent. You could do something like that too. You know, just because you, you see that in, in pro sports all the time, free agents, they jump from one team to another because it's a better situation. Right. And there's no reason why you shouldn't do that in your own life. But again, it comes down to comfort. Comfort. Yes. You you know, know it's like, you know, it's like everybody loves comfort foods. Why? Because they make you fat. <laughs> because they're comfortable. Yes. <laughs> but so, uh, yeah, I mean, but I mean, coming back to the whole self awareness thing, it's just basically what we're trying to say is when you have a stray thought and you're not sure where it came from, take a second, reflect on it, you know, and see. If I follow this thought, where is it going to take me? If I abandon this thought, where is it going to take me? Write it down. Yep. Write it down and set it. Even if you have no idea what it means at the time, set it aside. Yep. Come back to it later, and it might mean more to you. Right. You know, and I mean, don't don't sit there and just do the same thing over and over. Like Einstein says, the the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Yes. You know, it's take yourself out of your comfort zone and just start, just start small. Start small, like an experiment I did, I think I talked about in another podcast. I was out one day, I went to a store and I'm like going, and I, I did a little social experiment. And the social experiment was every time I walked by somebody, I would smile at them make eye contact and say hi inside the store and to see how that brightened people's days mm -hmm. because you know we're used to going to the store looking for what we want not talking to anybody unless we know them and just going on with our day right see i not love just, walking through a store with a smile on my face 
and just randomly smiling at people. But in the days in the age of COVID, with a mask on, I just look fucking creepy because it's just my eyes looking at people. Like, right. Man. <laughs> like, oh, <laughs> man, you're kind of weird. I'm going to get away from right. you. So uh, d- don't try your own smiling thing until you don't have to wear a mask. <laughs> right. But wear a well, mask. Well, you can still because, say hello. Right. But, uh, and, you know, wear a mask just because it's not about you. It's about other people. It's about it, it's about caring about other people. Right. So, okay, I want to talk about masks real quick. Okay. Because it kind of re- relates to being self-aware. So, the reason we got over seat belts and having to wear a seat belt is they created a conditioned response. Okay. Now it's a psychological tool that rewards you for doing a simple behavior. It's like Pavlov's dog. They were, they got him, they got the, he, he got the bell to ring and every time the bell would ring, he'd feed the dog. And then right. eventually he'd ring the bell and he'd watch the dog start salivating because the dog knew food was coming. So it was right. a conditioned response. Now the car companies worked with law enforcement and gave us a conditioned response to get us to wear seatbelts. It was something really simple. Listening to that goddamn bell go off in your car was worse than clicking the damn thing. Right. And that's all it took. Just put an <laughs> annoying little beep in your car that's going to play over top of your favorite song until you click that damn thing. And now everybody right. just clicks it. They right. don't think about it. It's like they jump in and it's like, oh shit, I didn't put my belt on when they hear that thing. And it's now yeah. it's not a big deal, but when it was first became mandatory, there was still the pushback that we're getting with masks today. Right now, yeah. we need to figure out what the condition response. The reward should be having the virus, you know, be at bay. But yeah. we haven't. Most people still don't believe there is a virus at, at this point. So as soon as we can create a condition response, we'll get people to wear masks. Right. But right now, there's no reward. Well, right. And I mean, yeah. So be aware of yourself, man. Right. Being, being self aware isn't just being aware of how you treat yourself, but it's being aware of how you treat others as well. Exactly. You know, if you want to be treated a certain way, it's like the old axiom, you know, treat people how you want to be treated. You know, it's the only thing you should take from the Bible. Treat others as you want to be treated. Right. That's, that's the only part of the Bible you should even give a fuck about. Right. It's the golden rule. That's it. That's all. And be aware when you're not treating people like you want to be treated. Right. Right. Yeah, I mean, I can't tell you how many times within the last couple of weeks I've snipped at my wife and then turned around and apologized for it because I realized what I was doing. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's, it's emotional transference, which we talked about in another episode mm-hmm. in the past. It's just, it's easier when you're feeling down to transfer that onto another target it, instead, it, it of, instead of targeting yourself, going after somebody else. It totally is. It totally is. And you, one, one thing as a, as a human, we, we do is, I mean, okay. First things first, it we have all the we have this movement about equality and acceptance and all that stuff that's going on right now, which I love. Mm-hmm. But humans as a species are ingrained to flock to what they like and hate what they what they're they're not like. So and part of that is we are conditioned to make people try to feel as bad as we feel. We try to bring everybody down to our level, or we try to make people feel bad because we feel so good. That's just, right. unfortunately, that's just humanity. It's the blue crab syndrome. It, yes, it is. Yeah, we, we've, we've talked about that. You're going to keep pulling them down, pulling them down. Yep. yep. And if you and... don't know what that is, you put – two blue crabs in a, in a bucket. If you put one blue crab in a bucket, it's going to crawl out. You put two right. in a bucket, it's going to pull the other one back down. And then the other one will try to go and it'll pull it back down. Yep. It's basically, you want people to 
to succeed, just not more than you do. Right. Exactly. And that's, that's humanity. That's how we've always been. Our tribe cannot do worse. Your, your tribe, we want your tribe to, you know, to do okay because we want to trade things with you, but we still want you to look up to us. Right. And that's, you know, that, that's just us as a species from the be- dawn of time. That's how we've been. And we're making recently, we're starting to become a w- self-aware as, as a society, especially, you know, here in the States that we're really, we're starting with tearing down monuments that we shouldn't have. We should never had up in the first place where we're, you know, bringing light to injustices that we're getting people that were never talking about these things to start talking about them. Right. But as a species, that's something that we have to get over. And to do that, it starts with you. It starts right. with me. It right. starts with yourself. Yep. The only way that, you know, the black lives matter movement is going to work. The only way that, uh, you know, social justice is going to say the end ending racism, ending, uh, uh, sexism the only way that any of that's going to start right here yep i'm not saying i'm the one that's doing it i'm not i'm not responsible for all racism and sexism in the country. but what i'm saying is you have to yep. you have to believe it in yourself and you have to make the change right because you change yourself you start changing the people around you as well because you raise your vibration it raises their vibration so on and so forth it, it's, exactly. a, it's a domino effect Yes. Um, but it, your choices are either better yourself and better those around you or be that, or in my case, be that, you know, I'd be like that old 90 year old man laying on my deathbed, miserable and alone. Yeah. Because I was such a miserable prick my entire life that nobody was there with me. It, it, yeah, exactly. And you know what? I don't want to be that person. You don't I don't either. Nope. I mean, I'm a prick, but I'm not a miserable one. <laughs> <laughs> you say here. It's like, I'm definitely an asshole. Right. Yeah. So, so, to sum up today's episode, we're just trying to talk about uh, self-awareness and, you know, using it to better yourself and get comfortable being uncomfortable. Thank you, Dr. Wayne Dyer. Miss you much. So I'm just going to say insert tagline here. Peace out. Love you guys.